Hi, I'm Seth Truger. Welcome to this week's uh, episode of JAMA Network Open Live. Hi, and I'm Mike Berkowitz. I'm electronic editor at JAMA and the JAMA Network, ready to talk with you and Dr. Seth Truger about the latest articles in JAMA Network Open. Great, and if you're following along live, please remember to add your questions or comments below on the Facebook post or reply to us on Twitter. And my phone screen has already been popping with signals from a group of people you know. So hello out there to Concernicus and Ketamin H and everybody else who's following us. So he is actually on Twitter. <laughs> I am actually on Twitter. Right. So All what right. do you have for us this week, Seth? All right, so our first paper, um, it is by Ruchi Gupta et al. at Northwestern, where I work, uh, and it's on the prevalence and severity of food allergies among U.S. adults. So food allergies is a trendy topic. Whenever I go to a restaurant now, either on the menu or the server comes up to me and asks me about any food intolerances or sensitivities that they need to know about. So mm -hmm. really it's in the air. Right. What do we learn from this paper? Right, so this is an interesting paper. Uh, and really they just try to figure out what's the epidemiology of food allergy and severe food allergy among US adults. Um, and there are really a couple of interesting findings. First of all, there are a lot more food allergies than I thought in America. Um, second of all, people think they have even more food allergies than that. <laughs> <laughs> so when you say they have, uh, there's more food allergies than you thought, you mean different right. kinds of food or greater numbers right. or Just both? Greater numbers. Um, so first, let's get back to the me methods of what they did. So they sent out a survey to about 40,000 people from two different sample groups and tried to figure out, you know, just ask people questions about do they think they have an allergy, what kind of reactions do they have, have they seen doctors about it, et cetera. Um, and they got about 40,000 respondents. What they found was that about one in five people, about 20% of U.S. adults, report that they have a food allergy. Um, if you look at figure one, they then went through an algorithm trying to classify where were these clinically significant allergies, are they actual allergies? Some people probably think they have an allergy because they were either told they were or had some sort of reaction, but it may not be an allergy. Um, it hasn't been validated, but it seems to have some face validity. It makes a lot of sense to me the way they kind of sorted these questions and without actually seeing 40,000 people in person and doing allergy testing, it seems pretty reasonable. Um, so what they found is one out of five people thought they had an allergy. Um, an allergy to food. By their algorithm, um, only half of those, one in 10 people, actually have a food allergy, and about half of those are severe food allergies. I see. And the severe, you know, they have this these stringent criteria. Do those apply only to severe food allergies or to any diagnosis of food, aller uh, food allergy, so the one in 10 number? Well, so that's what they try to figure out. The stringent criteria trying to classify, is this allergy a severe allergy? Do you have something like throat swelling or um, you have the list in front of right. you? You can cheat. Right, yeah. So I'm going to cheat and say that some of the stringent criteria that they use to transform this self-report of symptoms into what they hope is a convincing diagnosis of food allergy are things like skin and oral mucosa symptoms, hives itching rash, respiratory systems like uh, chest tightening and trouble breathing, uh, and chest pain, rapid heart rate, some uh, things of that sort. Some of those sound to me a little bit like carcinoid syndrome or right. some, some of these kind of weird versions of fish poisoning. Mm -hmm. Ciguatera poisoning, uh, that's from the internal medicine textbook. You might right. not see that much in the emergency uh, department. So I actually have a uh, family member with Ciguatera. Is that um, right? Yeah, it, it worked out really well for me because when I was in residency and I learned Ciguatera and um, what's the other one, the, the histamine one? Um, yeah, it'll come uh, to me. Scombroid. Yeah, yeah. Scombroid, right. yeah. When I had to learn those two fish-borne toxins, I already knew one of them because <laughs> Mark had Ciguatera. Uh -huh. um, it was actually terrible. He didn't have anything dangerous, but he had neuropathy for years. Is that right? Yeah, so that's terrible. serious, but it's not strictly speaking an allergy. It's right. more kind of a toxic reaction. And then some of these other stringent criteria uh, were like nausea and cramps and vomiting and mm -hmm. diarrhea. That doesn't sound like an allergy to me. That sounds like it could be food poisoning. Right. And it's and food poisoning. That's not a technical term, so don't take that home physicians. Right. It's uh, the technical term, of course, being stomach flu. Yes. <laughs> right. Gastro. Also not medical advice. Yes. The um, No, but the main point is they did a pretty good job. They might have overestimated the number of allergies based on these criteria. Criteria, but basically, if you had one of these stringent criteria and you reported food al aller allergy, excuse me, then they classify that as a convincing food allergy. If you had two or more, then it's a severe food allergy. Um, what they also found among those people with severe food allergies is that almost 40% of them needed to go to the ER at some point for their visit or for their symptoms. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. That's quite a bit, keeping me in business. Yeah, and there was something in here about kind of wheat allergy, and that raises alarms for me as, you don't, you know, we all walk through the stores and now see kind of non-gluten food products, mm -hmm. and there's this notion of both celiac disease and non-gluten 
uh, wheat sensitivity. And I wasn't sure whether some of that was wrapped up in this kind of estimate of food allergy, because a lot of people think that they're sensitive to gluten. It's never been validated as an actual clinical mm -hmm. diagnosis. No, um, my wife's a dietitian. She has a little bit of an interest in this area. Um, I've learned a little bit about it kind of on my own and with her. Um, I am by far an expert. It certainly seems like there are probably some people who do have some sort of GI syndromes that are related to food consumption, and those are foods that are have gluten in them. So there's probably some amount of it that is, I don't know, we don't really know what's going on. Some of it probably seems to be somewhat real. Um, some of it is, you know, certainly there are uh, hucksters out there who are willing to lighten people's wallets for money, right. um, which unfortunately really mixes all this stuff up, right. especially when we don't have hard science on it, which makes it even more difficult. Right. Sounds good. And I'm going to take you slightly off topic in one more area where we've had a sidebar conversation because one of the most common, I think the most common food allergy in this study was shellfish. Mm -hmm. Um, and back in the day when I was working at the Veterans Administration Hospital, shellfish was listed as an allergy across 50% of patients' uh, medical records because there was thought to be a cross-reactivity re with iodine-based radiocontrast. Mm -hmm. And you and I were talking about how that's a kind of fallacious notion, and I want right. to know what you know about that because you're ordering many more CTs now with radiocontrast or using those agents in, right. the, in the ED than I am. Right. So the bottom line is there is no relationship between being allergic to seafood or shellfish and being allergic to iodinated CT contrast. It just doesn't exist, other than the fact that people with allergies just tend to have more allergies. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing specific about that, and you can absolutely give people iodinated contrast even though they have a shellfish allergy. Similarly, you can't be allergic to the chemical iodine. Um, you know, we can make a, some hand-waving arguments about whether or not your histocompatibility complexes could actually, you know, do, I don't know, do right. the thing where they grab them. But more, more importantly, you need <laughs> iodine to live. It would be incompatible with life, and at least you'd be a cretin if you were allergic to iodine. <laughs> right. So um, we don't really know where that myth right. comes from. I couldn't figure that out. But mm -hmm. no, uh, no cross-reaction, so don't take that into your clinics with you, those of you who are watching us who might be in training. And the bottom line of this paper is prevalence and severity of food allergy in U.S. adults, no kids included in this study. Uh, are higher than previously estimated. Mm -hmm. If you believe this survey study, one in 10 um, have the allergy and mm -hmm. one in uh, 20 have severe allergy. Is that yep, right? absolutely. Um, okay. The other thing, they, they looked a little about whether people um, kept their allergies as they grew up, because we do outgrow some of our childhood allergies, et cetera. Some of these were adult onset allergies. And the other thing about the shellfish was that it's not only the most common allergy, but it's the most persistent among adults. Oh, per uh, wow, okay. Yeah. yeah, and something that I learned, just as a final uh, 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 goodbye point, is that a lot there was, there was an estimate here that a lot of people are developing these allergies when they're adults. Mm -hmm. um, those of us with kids know that it's all through preschools and, and primary schools, and I thought uh, a lot of these kids burn out, but in fact, a lot of these uh, adults end up developing these mm -hmm. food allergies as well. So that's a lot. Of, that's that's good information. We urge you to go to JamaNetworkOpen.com. It's the feature article on the homepage. So check it out. Great. What do you have next? next? Next, we've got another back pain article. So comparative clinical effectiveness of non-surgical treatment methods in patients with lumbar spinal stenosis, a randomized clinical trial by Michael Schneider and colleagues. Okay, a randomized trial. So that's mm -hmm. a high point for JAMA Network Open. We love to see those in the journal. Mm -hmm. What did this one look at? Absolutely. We all love RCTs. Yes. Uh, Ideally, the best kind of data we can get most of the time. <laughs> um, so what these guys did is they looked at uh, basically three different arms of patients who had back pain, uh -huh. which we're not really sure exactly what it was. It seems like a mix of kind of acute on chronic and acute back pain, the kind of what we see in our day-to-day -day clinics and, and practices. Um, people who actually met criteria for lumbar stenosis, um, both by symptoms and by some sort of radiographic technique. So having some evidence of some sort of um, you know disc involvement, et cetera, um, by whatever criteria supposed to use for this kind of stuff. Right. It's not really disc involvement because right. it's not disc disease. Right. It is uh, lumbar stenosis, which is some narrowing of the central canal right. or of the foramen with characteristic clinical features, right. which is neurogenic claudication and relief when sitting. Right. right. Exactly. Yeah. So this is pseudo claudication is what it's ta uh, taught as. Yep, yeah, absolutely. So basically a pretty tight definition of people who have lumbar stenosis syndrome, right. um, which is a little more exclusive than what we see in practice because we see people with back pain, not with lumbar stenosis per se. Um, but Anyway, so they move moving on. What they did is they randomized these people to three different types of treatments. Um, some got usual medical care, mm -hmm. um, 
which interest was was they both defined pretty well, but also it looks like they excluded opioids, which is interesting for a lot of different reasons. Okay. Um, the second group got group exercise, where basically they went to what's essentially um, a pretty plausible, pragmatic adult group exercise class okay. um, a number of times. Mm -hmm. And the third group um, went to what they call manual therapy slash individualized exercise, which was basically either seeing a chiropractor or a physical therapist and getting a kind of set regimen that could be adapted to the patient that involved three phases. It was, I think, you warm up on an exercise bike, then you get kind of physical manual therapy where they, I don't know, lay on the hands and do manipulations and things, right. um, and then a tailored exercise regimen. And in a lot of these kind of chronic pain kinds of conditions, um, or, tr or studies of those conditions, there's often crossover. Mm -hmm. People don't get relief from their pain initially, say, with uh, nortriptyline or whatever the medical intervention is, and then they seek an alternative practitioner or conversely. Do, did they say anything about crossover, whether there was background medical therapy in the non- medication treated groups? You know, I don't remember seeing much about crossover. I do remember um, they had the, the most people who dropped out were the people in the group exercise, which okay. might self-select for people who right. were most motivated to exercise or who were unhappy that they weren't getting either medicine or physical therapy. Right. Um, but I don't remember what they said about crossover, to be honest with you. Okay, no problem. And so uh, what, yeah. did, what were the findings? Yeah. Um, so basically the, the very bottom line finding is that everybody gets better uh, regardless of what you do, but it mm -hmm. takes some time. Okay. Uh -huh. So no, no surprises there, right. but the improvement, so this was, uh, the, the actual analysis here was a differences and differences approach. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested, if you're a stats geek or learning methods, you might want to uh, search on jamanetwork.com because we published a statistical brief about the differences and differences approach. Basically, you're looking at before after comparisons uh, and you are then comparing the difference in change. Uh, and so that's what they were looking at between these groups and they found a small improvement in symptoms that, uh, that favored one group over another, mm -hmm. I think the exercise, but there was a lot of dropout and that change really wasn't all that clinically significant if I understand their, cri th uh, their threshold criterion for what's clinically mm -hmm. significant. It was like two points on a questionnaire. Right, yeah, so if you look at figure two, um, it shows the main outcomes of how their pain did um, or the pain and symptoms did. Um, and in A, it looks at two months and B, it looks at six months outcomes. And you can see, the, again, the most striking thing to me is that at B, everybody got better and there are no more um, statistically significant differences between the different groups. There were a couple differences that mostly favored the physical therapy or manual therapy um, at two months. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not to say that feeling better at two months but feeling the same at six months isn't an improvement. There's, you know, area under the curve of your life experience during that four-month period. So, right. you know, even if I know I'm going to get better at six months, I'd rather get better at two months if I could. Right. Um, but again, these differences were relatively small as far as the symptoms went. Um, again, and something else that's striking that I found is that there were bigger improvements in the patient's actual ability to move and walk around mm -hmm. than they reported both either as far as how their pain felt or by how far they thought they could walk around. Mm -hmm. um, to me, what this reinforces is what smart people have been telling me to tell patients for a while is what we see is patients who return to activity with back pain do better than patients who don't return to activity. And most people probably err on the side of resting too much. So you need to get up, you need to walk to the kitchen, you need to you know, do your laundry. Um, I tell people don't run a marathon or anything silly like that, but right. you, know, you need to be moving it around and not just sitting around and watching That's Netflix. That's a great point. And I think another take home point from this that, that I understand is that in an era of shared decision making, mm -hmm. if they're all roughly equivalent and everyone gets better, at least as an initial intervention, you can allow the patient to select out the kind of treatment uh, mode that they want. If that's pills, that's great. If it's exercise, that's great. Uh, and if it's uh, an alternative practitioner like a chiropractor, that's wonderful as well. Physical therapists were in here too. Mm -hmm. Some of my best friends are physical therapists. I may have said that in a prior uh, broadcast. Um, and so uh, the patient can kind of uh, choose what they want and we can let them know that they don't need to worry too much. As long as they remain active, they'll uh, slowly improve on average. Right, and especially right now with the current landscape where we know that we're prescribing too many opioids and it's causing a ton of harm and we have pretty good evidence that opioids don't work in back pain specifically and right. probably don't work in chronic pain in general. Right. As you can see by a video we made at JAMA.com on a systematic review meta-analysis of opioids for chronic pain uh, back in November. Right. Um, but, sorry, that's a lot. That's a big mouthful of words. No, yep, and <laughs> you were a star in that video. Thank you, I think and, was... you and you presented that data. Uh, I did, well, yeah, not my for data. For non-cancer pain, so the bottom line of that systematic review and meta-analysis was that uh, there's really kind of weak evidence for the efficacy of opioids in non-cancer pain. Right.
Exactly. So knowing that other things that aren't as dangerous as things like benzos and opioids, which we know don't work well for low back pain and we know cause a lot of harm, it's helpful to know that there are things that are a lot safer that are effective at making people feel better. Right. Okay, great. So we learned a lot from this. Yeah, and what do, you have, what do you have as the final paper for today? All right, the third paper we have is the association between five-year clinical outcome in patients with non-medically evacuated mild blast traumatic brain injury and clinical measures collected within seven days post-injury in combat by Christine McDonald and colleagues. So this is a military study mm -hmm. of, uh, of soldiers, uh, I think men and women mm -hmm. in the field, uh, who suffer TBI, they're not evacuated, they continue on operating in theater, and what are their long-term outcomes five years after their, uh, their insult, right? Yeah, um, so first off, not surprisingly, as a military study, it's uh, men and women there were mm -hmm. 45 men and one woman. Okay, <laughs> very good. Um, but uh -huh. you know, it's a biased demographic. We're getting there. We're getting, we're working People on it. Rights. Yeah. Um, it's also a relatively small study. You know, they had about 45 patients in each group. Uh, they looked at patients who had a blast TBI while they were service deployed. So basically a, they were, in a, you know, say they were in a car that got hit by an IED, they got a blast injury. Um, in, con in contrast to prior studies done by this group and others, they didn't look at patients who were medically evacuated. You know, people got flown to Ramstein in Germany or wherever. They looked at the, the least sick of the patients who presented for care after a blast injury but didn't need to be flown anywhere. Um, and then followed them for five years, which is really impressive. And that's, you know, the power of the military with this kind of data. You can really get good follow-up on, on some of these things, even though, unfortunately, the sample size is limited. Right. Um, they compared these to other combat deployments people who did not have any um, you know substantial blast injury or TBI as far as they knew people who didn't seek care for any sort of head injury anyway um, and looked at a range of outcomes of things like symptoms like headache um, overall functional scores they used a whole bunch of different scoring systems um, and also looked at some psychiatric factors things like depressive symptoms PTSD both reported by the patient and diagnosed by doctors and things like that um, and unfortunately what they found is that at five years the um, the the military service people who w did have blast injuries did have worse outcomes pretty much across the board. Wow, so uh, there is a cost to service, as we mm -hmm. certainly know. Um, one question I had for you, were these non-medically uh, evacuated mild TBI soldiers, um, were they as exposed to military service as the uh, combat controls? That is to say, were they, uh, were this, was the number of deploy deployments, was the uh, duration of exposure to time in theater the same? Yeah. Do we know that? Um, I don't know about that specifically. They did look to try to see in that five-year look-back period whether or not they had you know, sought care for other TBIs. They did note that they're not able to, to quantify subclinical TBIs, so when the patients didn't seek care. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, one of the big strengths of this study is this wasn't a five-year look-back. They took patients five years ago, enrolled them in the study and then got follow-up data over five years mm -hmm. um, and again being one of the advantages of the, being a military study is that they were able to you know keep yep. track of patients within the system have a pretty good record of their care and it seemed like the patients had about the same rate of TBIs in the interim period mm -hmm. I think there were a little bit more in the blast injury group um, but again this is one of those things we're not gonna have perfect data right. it's gonna be a long time before we do three-arm RCTs of randomizing military recruits to blast injuries and not uh, <laughs> so this is pretty good um, right and uh, you know, on that theme of imperfect studies, I wondered whether there are mild TBI soldiers who are evacuated. Mm -hmm. They're not more severe TBIs, but whether that would have been a better control. Um, because keeping people in service, uh, I don't know whether they were uh, kind of hospitalized within theater or not, cared for by in mm -hmm. the military system within Afghanistan. Uh, or Iraq. I think this was primarily Afghanistan, right? Yeah, I think it was Kandahar, mostly. Uh, okay. Um, Which in I any think is in so in any event, whether that would have been a more apt comparison, but mm -hmm. you take the data that you have. You right. know, Rumsfeld said you go to war with the army that you have, and you kind of reap the data you can from the army that you have as well. Right. And again, this is just one slice. Um, you know, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on all of the military sure. data on TBI, um, right. but there seems to be a bunch of studies on a couple different comparisons across the board. This group has done, or they at least referred to their own work that they've done with some right. sicker patients. Um, you know, and again, this is just one piece of the spectrum of TBI compared to another piece of the spectrum of TBI. Um, and I'll admit my bias, my intellectual biases here, is that, uh, you know, we're starting to learn more and more about how things like concussions, even, you know, simple civilian sports concussions probably have a potentially bigger impact than we've historically given them credit for with things like post-concussive syndrome. Um, in my department, we've done a better job of trying to identify patients with concussion. Um, 
plug them into follow-up care for things like assessments for concussion surveys, et cetera. It was a QI project done by a resident a couple years ago with mm -hmm. a bunch of other um, people in the department, and, and it's really helped change practice, and I'm hoping bring better care to our patients. So let me just pick up on that. How is it changing practice? Um, for one, I'm giving people discharge instructions about concussion a lot more. I've certainly lowered my threshold to talk about potential for concussion, to kind of just discuss the whole potential about concussion. Mm -hmm. um, I basically have the same conversation, but with fewer words with patients about it, where I tell them that we've historically done a bad job, so I'm going to err on the side of giving you these discharge instructions. I'm going to err on the side of giving you follow-up with a specialist who knows more about concussion to screen, hear a bunch of symptoms to look out for, things like trouble concentrating, trouble sleeping, mood changes, right. um, and also just prescribing brain rest. Just, you know, go home and minimize screen time. Don't play video games. Try not to, you know, read complicated things. It's hard because I don't know what to tell people to do at home. Right. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, not, not only in response to that advice, but also whether um, I, my understanding, my very rudimentary understanding of the literature is that it's not clear whether brain rest, mm -hmm. however that's defined and enacted by the patients in their home settings, is even effective for the post-concussive syndrome. Yep. So, um, uh, but this is, um, a, you know, another piece, kind of another brick in the wall of understanding that any injury to the brain can be damaging both uh, psychologically as well as neurologically, and that difference between those kinds of two categories um, are, are, are narrowing, and we're going to get to a point, hopefully, in neuroscience where psychiatry and neurology are back and being the same mm -hmm. specialty the way it was in the 1800s. Right. <laughs> hopefully at a, at a much higher plane of that. Oh, absolutely. Um, but yeah, again, who knows? I, I'm not going to pretend to know whether or not brain rest works. Um, I'm right. a pretty avid video gamer. I'm not oh, terrible. I, I mean, didn't I, know that. I play video games. I don't okay. like do tournaments or watch YouTube videos of people playing video games, which apparently is a thing. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if I hit my head in a way that I was concerned about, I would scale it back myself for whatever <laughs> it's worth. For, for real. Yeah, for yep. sure. Okay. Yep. Well, so that's great. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a wrap for today. Um, be sure to go to jamanetworkopen.com. If you have comments, you can leave them. Uh, on Twitter or on Facebook, uh, and we can respond after we publish these. Um, they will be available to you on the platforms um, post live broadcast for you to review and comment. Go to jamanetworkopen.com. We release new articles every Friday at 10 a.m. Central Time in the U.S. Okay, of course, be sure to follow us on all the social media channels that you use, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Jamma Network Open. Um, and next week, we are going to return to a regular scheduled time of Mondays at 2 p.m. Central, which I think is 3 p.m. Eastern, but it's been a while for me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we should be able to stick that schedule pretty consistently, but uh, uh, you know, one of the downsides of the holiday is it's a little disruptive to our schedule. Right. We appreciate you watching. We appreciate your comments. Uh, take care and see you next time. Great. Thanks. Bye. Bye.